Hi guys, Emperor of Red here with What If Carl Tripped Into The DC Universe. Hope you enjoy and like this video for more content, and with that out of the way let's begin. Carl was pretty sure he was dreaming. Everything that he looked at in the waiting room had that somewhat surreal feel, while strange ideas and thoughts popped into his head as if they were facts that only made sense while dreaming. But once you wake up, you wonder why it completely made sense that you could fly around the neighborhood only as long as you could hold your breath. Things like that only make sense in the dream. So since he was dreaming, he decided to go with the flow and see where this dream was taking him. Looking around, he saw that everyone had a magazine and pen in hand, so he reached down next to him and grabbed the first magazine he saw. At first he was just going to pretend he was reading idly flipping through the pages and watching what would happen around him. But as soon as he opened the first page, he began to read through the magazine he was holding. Underscore 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 underscore. DC Comics Jump Chain CYOA. CYOA written by. Underscore underscore underscore. Carl squinted at the page. It wasn't signed by an actual name, it looked like a little black and white outline of a moon with a squiggly line coming out of the arc that reminded him of a cat's tail. Shrugging off the idea that it would have to be one big cat to have a tail the size of the moon, he continued to read. Underscore underscore underscore. The lists of superpowers and weaknesses are taken the DC wiki, and have been reproduced here for ease of access. Some entries have been removed, added, or modified to better fit this format. The DC universe is long and storied one, in more ways than one. Its universe filled with adventure around every corner, not least among them on Earth, an unassuming but cosmically significant planet out of the way of most space territories. Heroes and villains, from the bottom of the dark multiverse to the top of the monitor sphere, endlessly struggle for justice, for power, and for control over the fate of the very multiverse itself. You start with 1000, K points CP. Discounted options are 50% off. Discounts only apply once per purchase. Free options are not mandatory. Continuity. Continuity doesn't change during your time here, since each continuity has a past and a future unconnected to the crises. If you're in post-crisis you'll blow right through 2011 instead of seeing Flashpoint. This changes if you take the relevant scenarios. You can choose your starting date. Underscore underscore underscore. Carl yawned lazily as he scanned over the various starting points for continuity. Apparently this was one of those magazines that made little tests or quest on airs to fill out to stuff like if the guy and girl were good in their relationship, except it was a fun diversion for those who liked comics instead, creating a character they could play if the character was in the world. Looking around the waiting room at the other people who seemed to have their noses buried in their own magazines, Carl didn't think anyone would care if he filled out the form with the pen that hadn't been in his hand just a moment ago. Everyone else was doing it, so why not him? Let's see, the early Golden Age EGA starting date is in 1939, Carl figured that since no one else was talking, that he should keep his thoughts to himself too and respect the silence. The Golden Age GA starting date is 1941. Silver and Bronze Age SA starts in 1956. Post-Crisis PC begins in 1985. The new 52 and 52 starting date is 2011. Rebirth re-restarting date is 2016. And this is where not having read much comics comes back to bite me, since I don't know which one is better. Well, I've at least heard the term post-Crisis, so I'll pick that one. Underscore underscore underscore. Post-Crisis PC. Default star date, 1985. New Earth was a world of revised and consolidated backstories, rewritten to make it easier for new readers to jump in and follow the plot lines. Entire planets had their histories turned upside down, and many characters were left behind entirely. However, this wasn't a true reboot, and for the most part characters' lives continued on the same path they'd been on before and didn't start over from square one, barring prequel-style backstory comics. In 2006, the crisis survivors who'd been living in a pocket dimension utopia attempted to bring back their home world. They failed, but their actions had grave consequences, bringing 51 other universes into existence alongside New Earth, and Mr. Mind would go on to alter the histories of each in his hyperfully form. This continuity takes place in a single universe, until it becomes a multiverse on 52 universes in 2006. Underscore underscore underscore. Else worlds, you can go to any DC continuity without a jump, like the DCEU or Last Night on Earth. Mainstay character, by default, your visit here will last for 10 years. A long time, but nothing compared to the time scale of many events here. If you want, you can stay as long as you like. But be warned, for as much adventure to be found here, there is much danger lurking in the shadows. You can optionally set the jump to end at the time of your natural death. Legacy Chapter, if you've been to a DC jump before, you can go back to the same continuity for this jump, or have that continuity be an alternate reality present in this multiverse. Lost in the sliding timeline, you can decide which parts of canon you want to use. 
Ignore what doesn't make sense, events, or character moments you think are stupid, or even just jump to a single author's run while ignoring everything before and after it if you really want to. Underscore underscore underscore. Carl just shrugged, not really knowing what different options there were as far as different timelines, worlds, and continuities, so he left Elseworlds alone. He didn't think it was fair that his character would be booted out of the game after only 10 years of game time, so he circled mainstay character. Since this was the first he had picked, he had no legacy character, so he ignored that option. Carl liked having the option of choosing his own time, which he figured lost in the sliding timeline gave him, so he circled that. After thinking about it, he decided to skip past the 1980s and wrote 1996 for the starting time. By then the internet should be much more developed than in the 1980s. He grinned a bit at that. Of course it didn't make sense to want his character to have the internet, but hey, dream logic. Besides, even though he didn't really know any of the stories, he figured having a bit of veto power against the dungeon master would be nice. Very aggravating for DM, but whatever. The DM shouldn't be giving a power to the player if they don't want it used against them. Underscore underscore underscore. Multiverse alignment. Light multiverse. You were born in one of the worlds of the positive multiverse. As you grew up, you saw heroes triumphing over villains, leading the world into idealism and hope. You carry this message with you and fight for the peace and safety of all good worlds. Although there may be a cost, heroes have the advantage and will always triumph in the end. Dark Multiverse You arose from one of the worlds of the Dark Multiverse, a failed creation damned to sink and disintegrate, annihilating everything and everyone within. Dark Multiverse worlds are created from the fears and mistakes of those above, and due to their instability they derate and collapse when the person they originated from overcomes their struggles. Pain is inevitable here, and the villains have the advantage and will always come out on top in the end. If your world is destroyed before your time here ends, the Batman who laughs will arrive and offer you a position as one of his Dark Knights. Underscore 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 underscore. Carl shook his head in disgust at the Dark Multiverse and quickly circled the Light Multiverse several times. No way was he dealing with an evil universe in his role play. The next section had to do with choosing what race his character would be. Hmm. A lot of options here Carl thought when an idea came to mind. He had just read a story online by Dogbird Carol about Xander from the BTVS world choosing for Halloween as a cross between Lobo the Chanian and a Bizarro-esque Dimesianally fractured clone of Superboy. The super healing ability of Lobo fixed the issues with being a Bizarro dimensionally fractured clone, and he ended up being an overpowered being with practically none of the weaknesses of a normal Kryptonian. Even though Blue Kryptonite would cause his Kryptonian-esque powers to be weakened to that of a regular man, he still had plenty of strength of his Kazarnian half. And since Lobo was able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Superman, being that strong in his weakened state was nothing to sneeze at. So Carl circled the hybrid option at the very bottom of the list. Hybrid. Variable CP. You're a member of two races. Your parents must have quite the story. You have the powers of both at half strength, and pay half the cost of both racial prices. He figured that the overpowered healing ability of the Zarnian race would fix a lot of that, including the half strength nerf. After all, this was a dream, and he had been practicing his lucid dreaming, so he got to decide things like that in a dream. Besides which, he got veto power over the DM with that one toggle. So he figured he could veto that half strength rot. As such he crossed out the half and scribbled in full. Zarnian. 800 CP. Homeworld, none, you start off wandering through space. One of the last survivors of the same race as Lobo, somehow you survived the genocide he committed against his own people. Whether you can survive further will be up to you. Carl then began editing the Kryptonian section. Kryptonian Bizarro clone of a Kryptonian. PC, 1000 CP, a cold and sterile race that originated on the planet Krypton, the Kryptonians neglected the outside worlds and turned inwards, advancing their knowledge of science to an incredible degree even as their society stagnated. This proved to be their downfall, as reactions within the planet's core converted it into the radioactive kryptonite before detonating and killing all but a few, with almost none off-world at the time to survive. Kryptonians are identical to humans under the light of the red sun, such as their home star of Rao, but when exposed to yellow light their cells store the energy and use it to great effect. You may take linguist Kryptonian for free and up to 8th level intellect at a discount. Carl made his little adjustment, smirking at how he was gaming the system. After all, Superboy was supposedly weaker than Superman due to being only half Kryptonian. But his character was going to be a clone of a full Kryptonian. He chuckled a bit at that, since with his change he wouldn't be the love-hate child of Lex Luthor and Superman. After looking one more time at the list of skills and abilities a little further down, Carl decided that he may as well go ahead and grab one more race to throw in the mix since magical blood was 200 CP and the race he was throwing in was only 100 CP, which would give him magical blue for free. That would give his character access to learning magic. 
And this was the DC universe where magic was a thing. And while Kryptonians weren't more vulnerable to magic than normal humans, they didn't have any special protection against it. So he was just shoring up his weaknesses a bit. Atlantean. 100 CP. Home world, Earth. Inhabitants of Atlantis. Mildly superhuman but on land they tire out faster. You can take magical blood for free. The next section was history, and Carl chose clone, since that was the whole reason he was able to mix all those races together for his character. Clone. Modifier to heritage. You're a clone of another person, possibly multiple people. You share their appearance and genetics, although powers and other traits will depend on what you purchase below. You've recently escaped containment. Or, take 400 CP in exchange for still being held captive by the people who first created you, unable to escape just yet without great difficulty and being used for testing and experimentation. Carl went ahead and circled the option to take the 400 CP, since his race choices made him go into the red, point wise. Moving on the next section, he had to choose his family life. Seeing the chance for more points, he circled broken home and orphaned for 500, more camp. Broken home. Plus 200 CP. They say every functional family looks the same, but every dysfunctional family is broken in its own unique way. However it happened, your family life was cold and hard, and every day was a struggle. Maybe you found out your father was secretly a supervillain, and he reacted violently when you refused to follow in his footsteps. Or perhaps your older brother turned you into the police after you came after him for shelter, betraying you and turning his back on you in your time of need. You either have painful memories of your childhood that you'll have to deal with sooner or later and you will have to deal with your past in some way or another, whether you do it on your own terms or try to run until it catches up to you, or members of your close family are actively hostile to you. Carl chuckled. As a clone being experimented on in a lab, that would definitely count as a broken home. Orphaned. Plus 300 CP, can be taken with broken home. You had a great relationship with your family, and you all loved each other more than anything. Then your parents were killed, right in front of your very eyes. After this event you were either raised in an orphanage, by a responsible older sibling, or by a family friend. You never fully recovered from the trauma, and while you can live a normal life the memories have haunted you ever since. Expect to have nightmares, as well as issues with a family of your own. If this is taken with broken home, one of your members directly caused the death of the others, the ones who truly loved you, and will resurface sooner or later with plans for you. Carl figured that it wouldn't be out of the realm of possibility that one of the scientists that had been responsible for cloning him might show sympathy and caring for their creation. And then, just because there are some seriously screwed up villain assholes, another scientist could have had them killed for planning to help free their property. Yup, totally messed up, but he needed the points. The next section was a selection for teams. Carl shrugged, since he figured he might get on a team after his character escaped the lab. So he chose the Teen Titans, figuring that since he was a teen it would be appropriate. The next section was natural abilities. Since the Kryptonian race gave him up to 8th level intellect at a discount, he wrote that down which ended up being 400 CP. The levels of intellect refer to how many distinct trains of sophisticated thought a being can hold simultaneously, each working together to exponentially compound their ability to understand patterns and solve problems. By default you start as a 0th level intellect, the human baseline. You can purchase more levels for 100 CP each. For reference, the entire 21st century human population together is a 6th level, Batman is a 6th to 8th level, Lex Luthor is a 9th to 11th level, and Brainiac is a 12th level. If you take at least 1st level, you get 3 specializations free and can pay 25 CP for more. Specializations are fields of learning you're particularly talented in and enjoy doing, progressing much faster in them than others. Because this was a DC universe, and he wanted to shore up his magic weakness, Carl scribbled down next to its specialization, magic. Thinking a bit, he figured that he wanted his next one to be specialization, technology. He didn't know if a dungeon master would allow such a broad category, but hey. He should at least try. For his third specialization he figured he would write down specialization, combat. This was a world where he was sure his character would have to fight, if only to escape the lab. He then circled the magical blood ability that he should get for free from having Atlantean in the clone mix. You possess the ability to wield direct magic. Either because you're a pure homo magus or another magical race, a direct descendant of one, you grafted their DNA into yours, you stole their powers in a magical ritual, etc. Carl nodded at the next item down the list, which was emotional capacity, which governed his character's willpower. That would be useful against any of those magicians or any psionists running around. These use willpower as the default, as that's the most useful in isolation. For other emotions use the analogous amount. Talk about stubborn. You have as much willpower as the average Green Lantern, enough to overpower the combined will of your home planet. 
Your willpower is functionally limitless, short of using a lantern ring and pushing to your limit. You may take a power ring for free. Having that strong of an emotional capacity would help his character get over their shitty backstory and help deal with whatever his character would face. And getting a power ring for free was pretty cool. Naturally he chose the green lantern ring, since that was the only color ring he was even passingly familiar with. Flipping to the next page of the magazine, he saw that it was the skills list. Any skill or field of experience. Skills related to your career above basic level are discounted for adults. Enough to complete your task competently. A cut above the rest. You'll quickly rise through the ranks of your career. As far as most people can go, but not quite the ceiling. Most others are faceless mooks to you, but that's all you are to the real titans. Equivalent of a Robin or an average League of Assassins member. One of the best in the world. When someone needs help, when they've got a problem that seems all but impossible, you're the one they come to. Equivalent of Batman, Lex Luthor, or Zadina. The best, hands down. You're the gold standard in your field, and all others are judged by how closely they come to you. Equivalent of Lady Shiva, Brainiac, or Timothy Hunter. Looking at the skills section, Carl realized that with enough points he could buy his character instant mastery in any one field of experience. That was a heady temptation. But the point cost alone made him shy away from the idea of going deeper into CP debt, not to mention that it wouldn't really make sense for his backstory. Even if the scientists that created his clone character had the level of mastery of a skill to be able to download the information to his clone brain, why would they? The crazy scientists that do these clone experiments always want control over the clone for whatever reason. They want a virtual slave. So giving away that level of skill and knowledge would be the last thing they would do, since they would be afraid of their creation breaking his chains and escaping. Aside from that, his character was going to be an 8th level intellect. And an adolescent. He wouldn't really be expected to pull heavy duties in any career for a while, so he would have plenty of time to study. And due to the tier his intellect was in, he would be able to attain master status in anything he studied in time. He knew enough about Batman, Lex Luthor, and Zadina to know that that level of mastery in any field of experience was very respectable. And added in with his overpowered heritage of a bizarro Kryptonian slash Zarnian slash Atlantean, well, Carl had already stacked the deck quite high on his side. So Carl skipped the rest of the skills section and flipped the magazine's page to the next. World of Cardboard, Men of Steel. 0 CP for the jump, 200 CP to keep, discounted for light multiverse inhabitants. You don't cause any unintended injuries with your powers. Hug your partner without crushing them and knock out a criminal without causing brain damage. You can be sure that sticking a grenade into the mouth of an invulnerable supervillain won't be too much for his durability to handle and explode his head, merely enough to knock him out, and that the warsuit deflecting the policeman's bullets is strong enough to take your punch rather than using micropoint force fields that cause the person inside to crumple like a paper bag when you hit them with anything larger than a bullet. You can also control your emotions enough that you won't do something you'd regret a moment later. Whether you'll do something that you'll regret the next day is another matter, though. Carl figured spending 100 CP to make that permanent was a decent deal, just so that his character didn't accidentally roll a 1 and kill his own teammates. Yawning, he looked around once more and saw that the waiting room was empty of the people that were there earlier. He frowned a bit. Come to think of it, what was he waiting around for? Even if this was a dream, it was kind of boring to just be filling out some role-playing forms from a magazine. Seeing an open door at the end of the room, Carl got up and moseyed on over to see what was on the other side of the door. The moment he stepped through the opening, everything faded to black. Unknown to him, the magazine that he had left behind on his chair flipped open once more. There was a large red number minus 900 CP on the first page. Pages began flipping quickly, pausing at one section of the plot armor section. Contrary to popular belief, most extraterrestrial races across the universe don't all speak English, and communicating with alien cultures can be tricky when such a language barrier is in the way. You pick up new languages extremely quickly, and your overall communications skills are improved. You could be speaking a language fluently after a few weeks of watching people speaking it, and can get your ideas across with great clarity. Even if you don't yet speak someone's language you can communicate simple concepts by universal signals like gestures and facial expressions. Apparently it was decided that since Carl was two-thirds alien, he qualified for the item, and it was highlighted, with the CP cost going to zero. Pages began flipping quickly once more pausing at the superpowers section. The 600 CP that was set aside for choosing superpowers was absorbed by the CP debt that Carl had left behind, to leave his total at minus 300 CP. The pages then began flipping onward swiftly, until it arrived at the drawback section. The first plus 300 CP drawback was highlighted, cancelling out Carl's CP debt. More useless than Aquaman. It doesn't matter how powerful you are, people just think you're stupid. 
Aquaman could flood half the world and invade the other half with giant sea monsters, and commands an army versed in ancient warfare and magic. Does he get any respect? This can be mitigated somewhat, but you'll have to be a real badass. I'm talking growing a huge beard, never wearing a shirt, and losing a hand in a fight and then replacing it with a hook. The magazine then flipped closed with a bang that reverberated through reality, more felt than heard, completely unsuited to the simple visual of a magazine flipping closed. The next time he became aware, Carl realized there was something really wrong with him. His thoughts and mind felt like it was split into several different directions, some of his thoughts seemed to be turning inward and fighting him, causing him to feel completely confused and befuddled. His body was completely unresponsive, and he was simply experiencing the sensations of intense pain, and his body parts being in the wrong place and moving in ways they shouldn't. He finally realized that his eyes were open, and he was seeing something in front of him, but it was far too confusing to try to work out what he was seeing at first. He tried closing his eyes, but he was still able to see the horrible kaleidoscope of confusing jumbled images. And worse, he continued to feel all that pain. He had no idea how long it went on. It felt like it was nearly an eternity, living through the pain. His thoughts unable to coalesce into a coherent whole. It just went on, and on. Pain and confusion, unending. And then, one day, something changed. At the bottom corner of his vision he saw a pair of kind eyes peering in at him through what looked like a pool of water. But that blended in just above with an arm, connected to a leg, which waved a female torso dressed in a lab coat on top of it. To the either side of him he saw a hand pressing into buttons on the walls. And everything he was seeing was soaked in a pool of water. He then heard voices speaking, slightly muffled through the water. And he actually understood them. What do you think you're doing here, doctor? A sharp and angry voice demanded. The kind eyes spun around, and he saw the long brown hair of a woman. Hovering just past her hair, Carl saw a man's bearded face hovering glaring. His gaze alternated between the hovering female head and directed directly at Carl's eyes. I'm doing what I should, director. Despite what you think, he's alive and deserves the chance to be healthy and live. A strong female voice stated calmly. It is property, doctor. The sharp retort came with the wagging of the beard. Cadmus property. And you were ordered to dispose of it. You know what the consequences of betrayal are. Carl realized that something was flowing through his body. It was soothing in a strange way, even though it alternately felt hot and cold. But in its wake, his body felt like it was coming together in a way that finally made sense. Like it was putting his body back to the way it should be, instead of this jumbled mess that he awoke to. Suddenly his fractured vision snapped into place properly. And he finally comprehended what he was seeing. He was floating naked in a large glass tube that was full of some kind of fluid. It wasn't water, exactly, he could taste that much. But he was able to breathe the liquid just fine for whatever reason. Just outside the glass tube, he saw a woman with her back to him, being confronted by a brown bearded man with two security guards flanking him. The two security guards were aiming their guns at the woman. Thoughts about his situation flashed through his mind quickly. It didn't take him long to realize that he was some kind of experiment. And added on with that strange dream of a waiting room where Carl had filled out some form for this exact scenario, he could only conclude that he really was some kind of clone now in the DC universe. How very short-sighted of him not to take that dream seriously and come up with a better backstory for himself. Because now he was stuck in a tricky situation, trapped and slated for disposal. And he really appreciated whatever that woman doctor had done to fix what was wrong with him. It was probably Zarnian blood or DNA or whatever that she had injected into him that fixed him, based on what he had chosen on that character sheet. It can't have been easy to get a hold of a sample of Zarnian blood, not when Lobo could supposedly regenerate his whole body from a single drop of blood. So he had no doubt that Cadmus would be furious at the waste of resources using it on a failed clone would have been, in their eyes. I know what I've done. The woman stated, still in that calm tone of voice that sounded somewhat dull to Carl's ears. The bearded man merely wordlessly scoffed and ordered the guards to, do it. Not even a second later, the two guards fired their rifles at the woman. Her body jerked at the impact. Carl watched helplessly, eyes widening as he saw holes blossom in the doctor's back. She wavered on her feet for a moment while Red began soaking into her white coat. Carl then noticed that the rounds from the rifles must have gone right through her and impacted on the glass of the container he was in. There were cracks in the glass, and the fluid began leaking out. The bearded director noticed at that time that Carl's eyes were open and tracking what was going on around him. His eyes narrowed while glaring at Carl. She must have injected something to help it recover. Not good. He's not gone through indoctrination. Kill it before it escapes. The female doctor had collapsed face down on the floor by this point, and the guards turned their rifles Carl's way, causing his adrenaline to spike. Even though he knew he should be some kind of bizarro Kryptonian clone with a Zarnian's healing ability by this point, he hadn't had any chance to test those abilities. 
Up until just a few minutes ago he was still a normal human, so having guns pointed at him was quite a fearful experience. But he didn't get a chance to do anything before the guards began firing at him. His arms reflexively shot up to cover his face, and he accidentally smashed into the glass, breaking it further as the bullets were smashing into the glass from the outside. It was too much for the glass, and it broke apart, spilling the fluid out in a gushing rush that caused Carl to flop out and down to the ground, the rushing water staggered the three men's stance when it washed against their legs. Thankfully it meant they momentarily paused their shooting, giving Carl a chance to think about what he should do. Seeing a nice big shard of glass right next to him, he grabbed it and scrambled to his feet. Desperate to get to the guards before they could open fire on him again, he dashed forward. It was only a fraction of a second before he reached the guard, but it felt like time was stretching out. He could see everything that was happening in front of him as if it was slow motion. The guard's eyes began widening as he slowly, ever so slowly, began pulling his rifle back into firing position. Before the guard had moved an inch, Carl was there. He pushed the shard of glass forward, aiming at the man's neck. With a sickening squelching sound, the glass slipped into the man's neck. Carl hadn't held back, so his hand continued moving forward, to smash into the man's neck, throwing him back while he heard a sickening crunching sound from the man's neck. The shard of glass had broken off in the first guard's neck under the force of Carl's clenched hand, but he figured after his first attack that he didn't need it anymore to deal with the other two men, based on the way the first guard had flown back. Obviously he had some super strength and speed. He turned toward the next guard, who was still desperately pulling his rifle around. Without any further thought, Carl pulled his arm back into punching position as he stepped forward, then let the punch fly at the next guard's neck. Another sickening crunching sound echoed in Carl's ears as the guard flew backwards. Carl felt quite nauseous at what he was doing, but he felt like it was necessary. These men had killed a good woman who was only trying to help him, right in front of him. The director had ordered his own death. This was a matter of life and death, and he wasn't going to hold back until he was safe again. Spinning around, he sweep kicked out at the knee of the director, intending to cripple him and demand answers from him. His kick connected just where he wanted, cracking and bending the doctor's knee sideways in a way it shouldn't bend. But the kick followed through just as he had been taught to kick through what he was aiming at, and what was becoming apparent was his previous life. Back when he was taught to follow through in his kicks and punches, he had been a regular human. So it was necessary to maximize the force of the kick or punch by aiming beyond what you were punching or kicking. Otherwise you would pull the punch or kick before the full force was imparted, making the hit too weak to do anything. But now he was a crazy mix of bizarro Kryptonian, Zarnian, and Atlantean. And his kicks were much more powerful. His kick continued and smashed into the director's other leg, also breaking it in a most sickening.